For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter. Find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 p.m., only on talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Cardwell in for Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, on radio, online and on your smart, meter, uh, smart speaker. Coming up, hospital staff try to illegally access Princess Kate's medical records as UK security forces blame Russian bots for driving conspiracy theories online. The Rwanda bill heads back to the Lords where Labour peers are expected to stall its progress by reintroducing amendments already voted down by MPs. A network rail launches an investigation after a Ramadan message about sinners appears on a King's Cross station announcement board. So lots coming up this afternoon and of course it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions. We're asking this question, is it time for Rishi Sunak to call an election? Lines are open right now, 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your message or on the socials at Talk TV. But first, let's get the news headlines. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak's been accused of being scared to call an election. At the last Prime Minister's questions before the Easter break, Labour leader Sakir Starmer said the PM's entire focus is now trying to stay in the job. But Rishi Sunak ruled out rumours of a May election. As I said in January, my working assumption is that the election will be in the second half of the year. Uh, uh, we're ready. Just call it. Just but the Prime Minister's welcomed figures showing UK inflation has fallen to its lowest level for two and a half years. The price of goods and services fell to 3.4% in February, down from 4% in January. Meanwhile, the Bank of England is widely expected to hold interest rates at 5.25%. Ireland's Prime Minister Leo Varadkar has resigned for personal and political reasons. Varadkar became Ireland's youngest tea stock in 2017. He's confirmed he'll step down for the next general election. I know this will come as a surprise to many people and a disappointment to some, and I hope at least you'll understand my decision. I know that others will, how shall I put it, cope with the news just fine. That is the great thing about living in a democracy. There's never a right time to resign high office. However, this is as good a time as any. IT worker Luke DeWitt has been found guilty of murdering a couple in Essex with the strong opioid fentanyl. The jury concluded that Stephen and Carol Baxter were killed by the 34-year-old who worked for them. DeWitt is said to have described himself as a son to hunt them and rewrote their will to give him sole charge of their shower mat and bathroom company. The hospital that treated the Princess of Wales is investigating claims a staff member tried to access her private medical records. The CEO of the London Clinic, which is known for treating celebrities and politicians, has said there's no place for those who intentionally breach the trust of their patients. The data watchdog is assessing the report. And the final season of The Crown is leading this year's BAFTA nominations. Despite being played by controversy over its depiction of the royal family, the sixth season of the Netflix drama got eight nominations at the TV Awards, ahead of Happy Valley and Black Mirror. That's the latest for now. Let's have a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. Sunshine for some this afternoon, but for others it's looking rather cloudy and damp. Mainly across parts of northern England, the north and west of England and Wales, and then later that mass of rain that does turn light and patchy in nature as it sinks south and eastwards heads towards parts of the Midlands and eastern England. Further south of that, though, for many southern counties of England, we are going to see bright or sunny spells, especially in the southeast where it still stays very mild. And across Scotland and Northern Ireland, later northern England too, it will become drier and brighter. 
lighter and feeling mild there too with the lighter winds compared to recently. Overnight, that front continues its journey further south and eastwards down towards eastern and southeastern parts of England. So a mild, cloudy, damp night there with areas of mist and fog forming. Further north and west, there will be clear spells, but by the early hours of the morning, wet and windy weather will spread to the northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Severe gales for the northwest of Scotland likely. And through tomorrow, it's going to be a wet and windy affair across Scotland and Northern Ireland as that rain and strong winds continue to spread further south and eastwards later towards Northern England and the North of Wales. To the south of that, though, bright or sunny spells and still mild. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, thanks very much indeed for joining me. Lots to discuss in the next hour. And much like the royal family themselves, you might have hoped all those crazy conspiracy theories about Princess Catherine would have disappeared by now. Kate should be able to recover from her surgery in peace and have time away from work to rest without wild intrusions into her privacy. Unfortunately, it seems that just isn't possible because someone has attempted to access the princess's private medical records from the London Clinic, where she received treatment for a stomach condition. The video obtained by The Sun earlier this week of Kate and William out and about should have ended conspiracy theories swirling online, but that hasn't happened in the post-truth age. It also seems foreign actors are determined to fan the flames. UK security forces believe Russian-funded trolls and bot accounts have been spreading these lies. Yesterday, Russia was spreading fake news that King Charles had died, so it's not outside the realms of possibility in regard to Kate. Something else that seems to be never out of the headlines as well is the Rwanda bill. It's on its way back to the Lords today. On Monday, MPs voted down 10 amendments to the draft law, but Labour peers will try to reinsert five or six of the proposed changes. The bill will ping-pong, as it's called, between the two houses, meaning the bill might not become law until after Parliament's Easter break. Rishi Sunak's pledge to send migrants to Rwanda before June definitely looks doubtful. Odds are the Prime Minister will lose his bet and owe Piers Morgan a thousand pounds. Don't worry, Mr Sunak can afford it and then some, but can the taxpayer? The National Audit Office says new asylum accommodation is actually even more expensive than housing illegal migrants in hotels. It seems unbelievable. The Home Office expects its large sites programme to cost £1.2 billion. Meanwhile, Network Real has defended an Islamic message which appeared on its uh, customer display board at King's Cross Station in central London. What on earth is the station thinking? It's a mass transport hub. That's its only relevant function, in my view. There should be no religious messages on any type of passenger information boards or indeed anywhere else in the station. So what do you think about all this? This is my show, but it's your show too. Is it time for Rishi Sunak to call an election? Let me know what you think. Well, joining me in the studio is External Affairs Director at the Centre for Policy Studies, Emma Revel. Emma, it's great to have you here. Thanks uh, for having me. Nice to see you. Tell me your thoughts on the Kate Spiracy, Water Kate, whatever it is. It just doesn't seem to go away. We had documentary evidence that Princess Kate was alive and well <laughs> at a sort of garden centre kind of place in Windsor, yet this isn't enough for some people. It all feels faintly ridiculous because from the very start, the statement that came out from Kensington Palace said that she was having surgery, taking time away, and she wouldn't be doing any public appearances until Easter. It's not Easter yet. That timeline has gone exactly as, as planned. Um, and yet these conspiracy theories feed themselves. And the problem is, is they're, they're quite addictive once you start engaging with them. I, you know, use TikTok and get sort of, occasionally a video like this will appear. And even though, you know, I completely believe that they're all mm -hmm. talking rubbish and sort of think, why have people got so much time on their hands to sit and analyse, you know, how... Says you reading, yeah, the, exactly. reading the conspiracy theories. And this theories, is the problem, yeah. is, is that they yeah. are sort of entertaining and they are quite addictive. And then the algorithm learns so quickly that, yes. ah, this is interesting. Let's feed more and more I, of I must this. say, I, I, mean, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole with the Brazilian bum lift one, which was obviously <laughs> complete nonsense. But it is fascinating because some of this is just idle speculation. Mm. I think it's over 50% of people, you golf has said that people have seen, seen this online. Uh, I'm not too sure what the other 49% have been up to. It's just been absolutely everywhere. Yeah. But people just seem to want more and more of this conspiracy stuff, even though it's demonstrably not true. She's alive and well, went to mm. that uh, place in Windsor a few days ago. I think on the sort of lower end, it is quite harmless. It's people sort of, some of it is is you know, gentle mockery, which is completely yep. fine. And, and, you know, just making sort of spoof entertainment out of what should be quite ridiculous rumours. But then you come to the other aspect of it, where, as you said in your introduction, you have foreign powers feeding yes. the narrative and that is in very a destabilising yeah. way. And then that you become, you know, it's, it 
takes on a more a more sinister nature than just sort of laughing at a funny. Well, especially when they're rumor. saying things like King Charles has died, which yeah. he hasn't. That is totally fake news. He's alive and well yeah. as well. But it, it does show that these foreign actors are doing a lot of this and behind a lot of what might just be idle speculation from people who are, like you say, just having a bit of fun that goes yeah. too far, doesn't it? It does, and, and you do sort of have to to wonder what if anything can be done about it because you know people you know. yeah well what's the responsibility of, of twitter or tiktok or whatever should they take a role their community notices and so on that mm. they can put on it but there's not a huge amount they can really do is there not really and as i say some of it at the sort of lower end is sort of entertainment it's it's just sort of mockery and funny skits and making jokes about the idea that she's missing even though she's obviously not yeah it, and that shouldn't be banned or restricted in any way. That's just people laughing at the news, which is completely fine. It just, it, as you move along the spectrum of the type of stories and the type of conspiracy theories that are being fed and how seriously people take them, then you get into a more a difficult conversation about what, if anything, we need to do about it. Yeah, well, indeed. Um, well, the other major story today, certainly parliamentarily, and um, this came up with Prime Minister's questions earlier, was Rwanda and migrant housing as well. Talk about Rwanda in a second, but migrant housing is a fascinating one because it's now we're now in this bizarre situation where the close, taking migrants out of or would be asylum seekers out of hotels could actually cost more than keeping them in hotels. This seems absolutely crackers. What do you think? Well, it's partly because the running costs would be basically the same in terms of what you provide for, you know, the asylum seekers in terms of, you know, the accommodation, food and, and things like that. Um, but a lot of it, it, as with many things actually in British politics, goes back to the planning system. Yeah. It's, you know, changing the purpose of, you know, often it's barracks that are being used, dis disused army barracks that are being used. It's also the judicial review process, objections from local people, the local councils objecting to what the national government is trying to do it feeding into the court system and having to go under judicial review. All of that takes time. And the longer that drags on, that means that the Home Office is paying for the hotels, but yes. also for the accommodation they want to move into. And that is driving up costs. And, and, and how, how the impact on local people. The Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, branded the findings. This is a National Audit Office uh, study into this. Staggering. The British taxpayer is already paying out eye-watering sums on asylum hotels. And now it turns out the sites they promised would save, they promised would save money are costing the taxpayer even more. Rishi Sunak has taken the Tories' chaos and failure in the asylum system to a new level. Well, one way he wants to try to arrest that chaos is by sending people to Rwanda. And, of course, the Lords is involved in this long-running campaign of ping-pong, essentially, to try to stop the bills. Justin Well be involved, as are many other Lords and so on. The Lords can't really do very much in this, can they, Emma? They can't overrule the Commons at the end of the day, but they can keep tabling amendments, as we suspect they may do again this evening, um, and they can sort of drag their feet a little bit. Eventually, the Lords will have to give in because the Commons is the elected chamber. But the problem for the government is it has no majority in the House of Lords. There's no Conservative majority there. So they just have to you know, do as much of a whipping operation as they can, try and limit the amendments that the House of Lords can table and eventually, you know, encourage them to, to give up, which they will they will do because, as I say, the Commons is the elected chamber. Um, but it could take longer than parliamentary uh, scheduling allows. Yes. We only have another week or so before the Easter recess. And Rishi Sunak said he was going to send the first planes in the spring if we can't get this bill uh, if the government can't get this bill passed until Parliament comes back in late April, then it's you know it's not going to be spring. It's yeah. going to be you know heading towards June, July. And it was summer. really very interesting what Keir Starmer said actually at Prime Minister's questions, talking about 600 million. So actually dividing it down, saying about two million per person is going to be sent to Rwanda if those flights ever take off. Well, capacity is another big issue in our prison system, and there was a fascinating report in the Sunday Times, actually, about Alex Chalk, who we both know is pretty mild-mannered mm. uh, Justice Secretary, apparently losing it with number 10, saying, look, you've just got to make a decision. Are people going to stay, are you going to pass legislation to say people uh, can stay in prison longer, or are you actually going to release them early? Because we have fewer than 250 prison places still available on the prison estate. Mm. And uh, we'll talk in a second about another challenge from Liz Truss. Just your thoughts on the, the sort of headline problem here, Emma. Well, I, I don't want to talk about planning again, but a lot of it is planning. Well, we the don't... National Audit Office said, uh, what was it, three years ago, mm. said this is going to be a problem at this time? Yeah, we, we do not have uh, enough prison capacity to meet the demand. It means you have more people on remand, you have more you know, courts backing up um, and not being able to, to send people to prison or being reticent in some ways to, to give a custodial sentence because they think, well, we don't actually have anywhere to send them. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to build anything in this country, but prisons uh, does fall into that. No one wants a prison in there 
neighbourhood, but if we are to meet the demand or predicted demand um, yeah. for prison places over the next decade, we do have to uh, extend our prison estate because even what we have, a lot of it is Victorian. Yeah. Uh, it is, you know... Um, so there, there are many problems with the prison estate already there, yeah. but one of the other uh, issues is uh, Liz Truss, Shella Bravman involved in the sentencing bill, 42 Conservative MPs would impose a mandatory two-year prison sentence on prolific offenders. This is anyone over 18 in England and Wales who's been cautioned or convicted of 45 or more offences. And this really does annoy a lot of people. Yeah. What do you think? I think it's completely understandable. I think, you know, if you any member of the general public was told, oh, you can have this many cautions, this many sort of lower-level offences and not ever have been to prison. Well, we all know about those people, sometimes hundreds of offences. Mm. Do you think this, this holds water? I mean, Liz Truss is making serious headway with this, but do you think Rishi Sunak is actually going to say, yeah, let's go ahead with the capacity problems that are there at the moment? I think it's a reasonable thing for Conservative backbenchers to be pushing for because they do see themselves as the party of law and order. But it is going to butt up against the reality that we do not have places available in prison to put people were we to bring this into, into effect. We're also looking at having to let people out earlier. So, yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't seem realistic. Another, another aspect of that. Emma, thank you very much indeed. Emma Revel there from the Centre for Policy Studies. Thanks to everybody who's been in touch. The texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast. Eris says, uh, we don't need an election. We just need Sunak to step aside. Would you be happy perhaps with uh, Penny Morden there? Terry says, no, Sunak should wait longer and hope the economy picks up. Well, that's the gamble he's uh, having and continues to have. And of course, we've got uh, inflation today down to 3.4%. Rick says, Sunak should be allowed to finish the job he started and not call an election now will let us know what you think in all the usual ways. And coming up after the break, police are investigating hospital staff after alleged attempts were made to access Princess Kate's medical records. I'm Peter Cardwell in for Ian Collins and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, Trico. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, for, yeah. minute, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell in for Ian Collins, and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, hospital staff who allegedly tried to illegally access Princess Kate's medical records at the London Clinic Hospital, that was where she underwent abdominal surgery, they could face criminal prosecution. The attempted data breach comes as UK security forces suggest that Russian-funded trolls and bot accounts may be deliberately spreading conspiracy theories on platforms such as X and TikTok. Footage obtained by The Sun earlier in the week showing the princess looking healthy and relaxed during a recent shopping trip has failed to quash wild speculation about her health. Well, joining me live is the author and royal uh, biographer, Tom Bauer. Tom, thank you for joining me today. Uh, we have seen footage of Princess Kate out and about at a kind of garden centre in Windsor. What more proof do people need? This must be shocking and surprising to you as someone who's followed the royal family for such a long time to actually see well, the, these crazy conspiracy theories? Well, cr crazy conspiracy theories even perpetuated by a BBC reporter. I mean, that's how mad the whole thing has become. Uh, there seems to be a feeding frenzy, which unfortunately, uh, Kensington Palace and Buckingham Palace have not suffocated. They haven't put it down. I should and say I the BBC reporter did take, that, did take that information off off their Twitter, but at the same time, this is this is everywhere, isn't it? Anywhere you go online, in every timeline, including mine, there are all sorts of conspiracy theories, even though we've seen her alive and well, Tom. I agree, but I mean, they may have taken it down, but the truth is, how could a BBC reporter actually perpetuate that sort of falsehood? I mean, it's just beyond belief um, what has happened. The news management is really appalling at the moment, uh, and I blame the palace for that entirely. I don't think it was very wise of Kate and William to go to that shop on Saturday morning without a lot of pre-preparation. Mm. It was silly to actually allow just a member of the public, so to speak, spot them. That was just very bad news management. Because but that was I mean, always going to be problem... grainy, Tom. That was always, it was not going to be a sort of official thing. But then I suppose if they had had an official thing and they called a camera crew or a photographer to be there, they may have been criticised for that as well. Can they do anything right at the moment? Now the, the trust has been breached in regard to the, the photograph that came out on Mother's Day? Well, I think they could be. I mean, they shouldn't go out. They should stick to the original plan, which was that she would be available after Easter. The real problem is they keep the palace keeps on changing the agenda, although I do think the Waleses keep changing the agenda too, is all just out of control. And the only way to stop it, the only way to control it, is to make sure they don't appear in public until it's very carefully orchestrated. And as for all the trolls and the rest, this is all a feeding frenzy because, again, uh, it's been so badly managed. Uh, this is a woman who clearly, even from the photograph on Saturday, is not looking terribly well and needs time to recover. And if only there was a spokesman in Kensington Palace or Buckingham Palace to make that clear, it would be so much better. But unfortunately, uh, this has all got out, out of control. And I do believe that there is a sort of feeding frenzy, which is part of the reason why in the London Clinic, allegedly, somebody tried to get her records because they could get a lot of money for it. Uh, people will capitalise financially on this story. Again, it's most regrettable. But I do blame the palace for letting this happen. You're one of the top investigative journalists in the country, Tom, and you will know the lengths sometimes people go to, although I'm sure you never have, to pay money to get things like those medical records. Where is that likely to have come from? Because we hear all these theories about Russia, about other state actors and all of this. Would that likely have been something to do with the country, do you think? Or do you think that would have been just a newspaper or, or media organisation? No, I think if it did happen in the London Clinic, it was just one individual who saw a, a case of has a source of easy money. Uh, I mean, there are always these sort of people in institutions who are greedy and unscrupulous, and it's the management's task to make sure they're quickly spotted and kicked out. Uh, it, of course, it's a hugely damaging to the London Clinic uh, because this is a terrible thing to have happened if it did happen, but it is awful. But I do think Russia and the trolls there will be fueling this speculation. I mean, one of the great assets Britain does have is its royal family. And Russia is now an enemy because of the Ukraine war. And they can see quite easily a rich picking field to file lots and lots of damaging stories to undermine the world's confidence in our royal family. Well and the royal palaces should have been aware of that danger 
and made sure that it was instantly nipped in the bud, but unfortunately they didn't. Well, on that and point, Tom, but problem we, nowadays. on that point, Tom, we've seen William has mentioned Ukraine and presumably made himself a target for the Russian government on that. We've seen a lot of changes in how the royal family has been dealing not just with political issues, live political issues, but also in terms of its PR management and so on. We have this sort of weird, to me anyway, and you're the expert, a sort of half in, half out kind of idea where we're given some information about their health, but not all information about their health. Can this situation continue and who's to blame for it? You say there are lots of problems, but is it the PR machine? Is it the wheels as themselves? What do you think? Well, I do think it's the palace's officials, but who appoints them in the first place is the real problem. King Charles, when he was Prince of Wales, was notorious for only employing people who said yes to him. And if someone said no, they were instantly fired. I fear that uh, William, the Prince of Wales, has, is copying his father. And together, neither of them are actually making sure that they have wise, experienced men at the centre strategizing how to cope with this problem. It got off to a good start and then went pretty bad. I mean, the, the public, of course, was very sympathetic to both William and Kate and, of course, King Charles for their illnesses. And they're very popular. Uh, but unfortunately, it has now gone a bit sour. Of course, it can be rescued. But at the moment, I don't have much confidence that there's anyone in either palace who has the ability and, more importantly, the trust of the King and Prince William to actually get a grip of it. That is the problem. It, seem, it seems to just be floating around rather yeah, yes. than... Yes, how, how can anchor. it be rescued, Tom, just briefly? Well, it can be rescued just by having a proper strategy. Someone should come out who is a named spokesman and say, this is the situation. I am speaking on behalf of the King and Prince, uh, Princess, uh, Prince of Wales and the Princess Kate, and this is what's happened. And I now ask you to go away and believe both are alive and recovering in one way or another, and there's nothing more to be said till after Easter. And that would do the trick. Uh, it's just everything is always anonymous. Mm. It's fed out through these royal correspondents or not fed out, and there's nudges and winks, and it's just a ridiculous way of communicating with the public. They need to be real. Tom, thank you very much indeed. That's Tom Bauer there, who is a uh, royal uh, author and uh, investigative journalist as well. Thank you to Tom Bauer. Quite a lot of people getting in touch um, on Rishi Sunak as well. The question we're asking in regard to his future and, of course, whether an election should be held. Patricia says, get that Sunak out. He's useless. Roger says, the debt won't go away, whoever is in government. And the good news about an election, says Parker, is that 14 rotten years of Tory government will finally come to an end. The bad news is that the incoming Labour government won't be any better. Well, we'll see, won't we? It looks as if that is going to happen. And uh, Brenda says if he cared for the well-being of this country instead of himself, he would. Well, Rishi Sunak is certainly set for another battle in his bid to get his Rwanda migrant plan up and running before his self-imposed June deadline. On Monday, MPs voted down 10 amendments to the law made by the House of Lords. Well, the Prime Minister's plan was to have Rwanda legally declared a safe place after the Supreme Court ruled that sending illegal migrants there would constitute a breach of their human rights. It's expected Labour peers will try to reinsert a number of the changes already rejected by the House of Commons. It's complicated, it's confusing, and does it actually get us anywhere? Well, Sir Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak exchanged heated words over the plan at Prime Minister's questions earlier. Rwanda gimmick is going to cost the taxpayer £2 million for every one of his 300 people that they deport. When it comes to this question of how to deal with people who are here illegally, his values are simply not those of the British people. After all, this is the person who campaigned to stop the deportation of foreign dangerous criminals, Mr Speaker. It certainly got pretty personal in... Uh Prime Minister's questions. There are lots of questions about uh, who the people that Sir Keir Starmer had represented, certainly when it was a lawyer as well. Well, let's get into all of this now with Alan Tolhurst. He's chief reporter at Politics Home. Alan, thank you very much indeed for joining me uh, today. I mean, this really is just not going to go away for Rishi Sunak, but will there be progress made? Because this sort of ping pong between the Lords and Commons is a bit of parliamentary procedure. Most people don't understand. And no matter which side of the argument you're on, surely people want to either say to Rishi Sunak, like, get on with it, or alternatively, ditch the plan, which he's not going to do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as, we, as we saw, the, the Lords voted for a number of amendments that went back to the House of Commons, where MPs uh, 
rejected them all. We know that there's going to be a number of amendments probably passed this evening by peers again. And if so, that means that it's unlikely that the bill will get through its final stages of the Commons and become an actual act of Parliament before uh, MPs break up for their Easter recess. They were not back until 15th of April, which obviously potentially puts back even further the chances of the first plane actually taking off. So the government really um, is, is probably going to try and get as many of its peers as possible to try and get there tonight to try and effectively win those votes in the House of Lords so it doesn't get passed back to the Commons, whether they'll be able to kind of bus in enough of their peers in order to do so and manage to convince enough crossbench peers to vote with them, given that they, originally those amendments were rejected, you know, whether they'll be able to do that, that's obviously a, a big factor in whether this bill actually gets over the line in the, in the coming weeks, and whether the government is actually able to get those planes moving as they want to, you know, ahead of an election. No doubt this will raise questions as well from people saying, well, if you're saying the Rwanda plan won't work, why do you have to block it, House of Lords? Um, we've seen a lot of opposition from the bishops as well. Who are the sort of key players in the Lords in this? Because I think a lot of people will say, hold on a second, nobody elected you. Yeah, so a couple of the, the key ones actually are Labour figures. Um, uh, Lord Falconer, who was Attorney General in, in Tony Blair's government, he's been pushing a lot of this in his uh, amendments. He, he's also suggesting that actually a good outcome is pushing this back beyond an election. So clearly he is of a mind that the peers should use their ability not to reject a bill outright, but to just frustrate it for long enough that it doesn't come onto the statute book. Uh, similarly, uh, Baroness Chakrabarti, uh, she was a Labour peer. She was uh, put to the House of Lords by Jeremy Corbyn, served in his shadow cabinet. It's also been pushing but it's essentially to, to tighten up the legislation. They're not necessarily looking to, to reject it out of hand, but they think that the, the, the bill itself, by bypassing judges who decide whether Rwanda is safe or not, is against the kind of the rule of law, and they want to reinsert the authority of the Supreme Court and judges to be able to decide whether actually people's human rights will be breached by sending them to Rwanda. But certainly what Parliament is essentially declaring Rwanda safe and circumventing the Supreme Court in this by changing the legislation. It's interesting from their perspective as well. I mean, they're not really listening to the Lords. A lot of this process is pretty pointless, isn't it, Alan? Well, yeah, given the fact that, you know, there wasn't really much of a discussion when those amendments were passed by the Lords, they went back to the Commons and, you know, and, and the government used its majority to, to smash all of them, essentially. And there wasn't really much of a, a kind of a, a to and fro accepting any of those things. And similarly, again, if the Lords do pass a series of amendments again tonight, when it does get back to the Commons, I think it's unlikely we'll see any kind of you know, uh, softening of the government stance. The government is clear, this is the legislation. It's very sort of narrowly worded to be able to achieve what it wants to achieve. And therefore, it's not really willing to compromise. So yeah, it, the reason it's called ping pong is just because it goes back and forth, back and forth, and no changes are really made to the actual legislation itself. Some pretty astonishing statistics and figures today from the National Audit Office saying that new asylum accommodation is even more expensive than housing illegal migrants in hotels. Uh, large sites in the Home Office's programme that could cost £1.2 billion, pounds, so that's £46 million more than using hotels. People will find this astonishing, Alain. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we know, obviously, the last year there was a big push the government to use hotels, uh, several hundred hotels were co-opted and it was costing the Home Office about £8 million a day. And that's when this big project came in to use uh, the barge, the Bibby Stockholm, you can see on screen there, along with a couple of former RAF bases, some former student accommodation. And the government initially suggested it would save £100 million. As you point out, figures from the National Audit Office, which is the government's own kind of spending watchdog, suggest actually it's going to be almost £50, 50 million pounds more, given the high cost that it's taken to convert this accommodation to be then usable for uh, asylum seekers so yeah not really a, a good sign and obviously coming alongside the rwanda bill potentially being delayed the government clearly is pursuing a strategy you know ahead of an election that it wants to see the economy turning around and the kind of stop the boats mantra being able to be done this obviously is not helping with that it's essentially those two stories coming out on the same day when on earth do you think those flights are actually going to take off Anna? when is that going to happen is it going to be this side of an election i mean what what do you think in your political judgment yeah i i think that they will they will get this this legislation will get passed, whether it's before Easter or after Easter, it's definitely going to get passed because there isn't well, there isn't the ability to, to essentially to block it. But clearly, there is still some issue on Rwanda's side. We've heard them talking about wanting to stagger the, the people who come across. We know there's not huge numbers anyway, but it looks as though they're not essentially necessarily completely ready for a huge numbers either. You know, I think we could, the government will be pushing really hard to see at least one flight take off, the sort of symbolic yeah. first flight. It's actually before an election to say, look, give us the ability to carry on with this policy. It's working. It's going to be a deterrent. I am pretty, 
I, I wouldn't be that hopeful if I was the Home Office that it would get done. It's just a sort of project that's been in train since about 2022. You know, they got very close then. They had people on a plane, on a runway. I remember I do that, feel yeah. It might be, I, I feel that might be as close as they ever get, unfortunately, for the Home Office. Well, we'll see what happens, but uh, I'll stay with us because Rishi Sunak has another battle on his hands, but this time it comes from within his own party. The Prime Minister is hoping to reduce pressure on the prison service by doing away with custodial sentences of less than 12 months. But Liz Truss is among 43 Tories who've signed four amendments to try to harden up the sentencing bill. Sir Keir Starmer challenged the Conservative Party's record in criminal justice at Prime Minister's questions today. After 14 years of Tory chaos in the prison system, the Justice Secretary have reduced to begging the Prime Minister either to send fewer offenders to prison or to release them even earlier. I must say I've got sympathy for anyone trying to get an answer out of the Prime Minister. So what's it going to be? Fewer criminals behind bars in the first place or more released early onto our streets? Which is it? Mr Speaker, thanks to our record and plan, violent crime, violent crime has fallen by 50 per cent, Mr Speaker. We've recruited more police officers, given them more powers and kept serious offenders in prison for longer. No clear answer there from Rishi Sunak. Alain is still with me and joining me as well as retired prison governor Vanessa Freg. Vanessa, just before I come to you, I just want to ask Alan, Alain his opinion first. Um, Alain, I mean, no clear answer there from Rishi Sunak. No, uh, I mean, Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary, asking just for a straight answer from number 10 on that, uh, apparently before the weekend. We still haven't got one. I mean, this is another political crisis for Rishi Sunak. And we were also told by the National Audit Office that this was coming down the track. Yeah, absolutely. And anyone who's done anything around prison stuff or justice stuff for the past year will know how desperate the situation is with overcrowding in prisons at the moment. And this bill has been in train for quite a long time. The government, they know it's politically difficult because there are lots of MPs like Liz Truss and others who are against the idea of not putting people in prison when they're uh, past sentence. Essentially, you know, they've not expanded the prison paces over the years and it's kind of the chickens coming home to roost. I think just on a, on a more broad point, the fact is that Richard Sunak for a long time didn't suffer any major rebellions, didn't lose any votes. He's now getting it from kind of all sides at the moment. And it kind of shows that his authority is really kind of weakened at the moment, given the fact that, you know, MPs are making it pretty well known that they're willing to bring down a kind of key piece of justice legislation yeah. over the fact they want things changed on this on this subject. Well, also when someone like uh, Alex Chalk, who is about as loyal as you can get and about as mild-mannered as you can get, the Justice Secretary is not in your corner, at least in private. Well, you know, things are seriously difficult for Rishi Sunak. Alan, thank you. That's Alan Tolhurst there from uh, Politics Home. And uh, Vanessa is with us. Vanessa, what are you make of this in terms of the fact that uh, there is some sort of plan to scrap short prison sentences? Do you think putting people in jail for three months, six months actually makes a difference or actually perhaps it makes it worse because then they're being exposed to the prison system and being influenced in, uh, in nefarious ways? Uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I mean, this this bill is is possibly the only thing that I've actually agreed with with this government. Um, you know, the Prison Governors Association has called on on various governments over the years that the twelve month sentence is is just no use nor ornament. Uh, this government again has meant, like many others, been um, reactive rather than proactive, and um, you know they are a victim of um, their success with our prisons as as overcrowded as they are now um it's very it's very difficult to manage an overcrowded prison and as we're seeing you know there are there are uh, much higher instances of self harm of violence um in prisons and this is because you know they are overcrowded when you've got a cell that's designed for one person and we've got three in it um, so what is life I like for those prison officers, those brave men and women who do a pretty thankless job dealing with an overcrowded prison? We're hearing those tornado teams uh, aren't there in some prisons, those teams that help when there is a prison riot, for example, they're all constantly on standby. Uh, it can't be much fun for the prison officers and for the prisoners who we, of course, uh, no matter what they've done, we, we owe them a basic standard of welfare. I mean, this is a real crisis, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it and it's and it it goes on and on. You know, this isn't the first time that we've had to release early and Jack Straw did it in 2007. And that went on for three years, having a early release scheme, because the prison estate then at 44,000 
was uh, was in crisis and overcrowded then. And that's what about so, half of what it is now. We've got about 80,000 people in prison now. So prison estate has got a lot bigger, has it? Yeah, and I think it's predicted to rise um, in the next couple of years to over 100,000. Um, you know, when, when you focus on locking people up, this is what happens. Instead of focusing on reducing reoffending, and, you know, when you lock somebody away for 12 months, they do six months, uh, when, they, when they're eventually released, you know, they've probably lost their support systems, they've lost their uh, job, their home, um, and we, we've let them, you know, mix with hardened criminals for six months um, and, uh, and go out to commit further crime. And once they're on that, that um, merry-go-round, unfortunately, they don't go off it. And this is why the 12-month sentence is no use nor ornament and causes more problems. It doesn't address offending behaviour. It doesn't um, address uh, homelessness, um, addiction, you know, uh, to alcohol, drugs, whatever. And I think that um, getting rid of the 12-month sentence is, is the best thing that we can do. I did notice that um, Liz Truss with her um, and Suella, Suella Braverman with her amendment. Um, one of the amendments was um, that the judge must um, be um, assured that they're not going to reoffend whilst they're doing a suspended sentence. I wonder how that's going to be monitored. Mm. Um, but it is frustrating, I, Vanessa, I... is it not, to people who are victims of crime who might say, as Liz Truss suggests, if you're convicted of 45 or more offences and some of those people just don't go to prison at all, and she's saying that should be a two-year mandatory sentence. I totally agree with you. There just isn't room in the prison estate for a lot of those people. But you can understand the victims of crime want justice. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I've been my, a victim of crime myself, so absolutely I know um, I'm sorry how to hear that, frustrating Vanessa. it is. Um, I've been a victim of crime myself, so I, I understand yeah. absolutely how frustrating that is. But I think we need to look at the bigger picture. And the, and the, and the minor crimes... Um, Oh, the punishment is much better served in the community and yeah. serving the community that they've offended against. I don't like this, you know, scrubbing graffiti off the walls and, and, and that thing. They need to be doing something totally valued within that community, building, you know, schools or build, helping um, in playgroups or libraries, things like that, that things that can make do, a real difference. Do people difference. want prisoners helping in playgroups? Uh, well, not all prisoners. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think I think if they're going to do a community sentence, they need to do something worthwhile within the community. You know, building playgroups is yeah. is probably what I meant. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously each each individual is going to be risk assessed on on their of risk course, and what yeah. risk they pose to the public. That goes without saying. You know, that's what you do with prisoners on from the moment they walk in a jail to the moment they walk out is 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 manage the risk okay. and uh that's something that that needs to be done but i i i do hope that if they do do the early release scheme that um they manage them properly in the community yeah. you know gps tags have moved on significantly over the years yeah technology absolutely. has much improved well, let, let's um, hope that technology and, works. Uh, Vanessa, thank you very, very much indeed. That's Vanessa Freck there. She's a retired prison governor, author of The Governor, My Life Inside Britain's Most Notorious Prison. So thank you to Vanessa. Thanks also to David, who's been in touch on text. He says the longer Sunak delays, the more votes he will lose as he's absolutely useless. Arthur says Sunak's waiting for the removal company to give him some available time slots. Well, coming up after the break, we're going to talk about arrivals, departures and religious doctrines. King's Cross Station in London is criticised for displaying a Ramadan message about sinners. I'm Peter Cardwell in for Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. 
and yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell in for Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Well, Network Real has been branded misguided after an Islamic message was displayed on the departure board at London's King's Cross station as part of a diversity initiative. The information screen showed times for sunrise and sunset prayer times and read, all the sons of Adam are sinners, but the best of the sinners are those who repent often. Well, Claire Muldoon is with me. She's a broadcaster. I also want to, just before I go to her, I want to thank Christian McDonald, who's been in touch on Twitter, who says, Station Info Boards, your opinions are irrelevant and information is intended for the public and should not be used for personal political statements. Well, I wonder, Claire, what you think of that? Well, I, I actually agree. And I think this is one of the only times, Peter, where you'll ever get me to agree with any of the secularist or humanist movements in this country, because... I don't think that religious meanings, religious um, moats, religious tropes, religious anything should be railed out, especially not in places of public interest and public pathways and public infrastructure and publicly funded buildings. And, you know, I was very interested to see that uh, Network Rail in the response, this is quoted in The Independent today, they said that we celebrate all the big religious festivals from Christmas to Ramadan at King's Cross to reflect completely what you've just said, actually, Peter, a diverse passenger and um, employee base. Now, I'm sorry, I have never, ever, ever seen a crib or seen a crucifix for Easter, a crib for Christmas, at any of the stations that Network Rail own or actually work with. So it's just absolutely an absolute anathema. I don't understand it and I don't get it. And I think it's fundamentally wrong. I agree with you, Claire, and I think that a lot of this is trying to be relevant, trying to be politically correct, and I am not religious, but I know a lot of people who are, including you, Claire, and uh, some, a lot yes. of my family are very, uh, very uh, committed Christians, I know very committed Muslims as well mm -hmm. in my circle and so on, and they don't want this, it just seems to me anyway, and I wonder what you think, to be mm -hmm. kind of virtue signalling actually. It's completely virtue signalling. And to be honest with you, Peter, I think that's the only form of signalling that Network Rail are able to do at the moment. <laughs> Maybe we would take a div divine intervention to make the trains run on time, Claire. But, well, this is this is my other point. Maybe they're praying to Allah, you know, to enforce, like, the, the, the stop of strikes, for instance, over the Easter period, or even for the trains just to run, which yes. would be perfect. Maybe they should focus As on well, that. They developed... 
I, I, they absolutely should be focusing on that more than giving different claims. And the, the other thing that I've got about this is, I mean, um, Sadiq Khan has not said anything. I want to know who actually signed off on this mm. to make the, to make it a thing. Imagine the thought process and the meeting that was had over coffee, over whatever. Well, I, I'm presuming it was a Muslim uh, member of staff that wanted it, that suggested it, and then they wouldn't be, um, they'd be fasting anyway during this time. But the other thing is, we don't want to be London-centric. The whole thing about Top TV, about other news works, it is that a network rail travels the length and breadth of the country. But the times that were put up are only times where sunrise and sunset, the call to prayer, uh -huh. and they're specific to London. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, of course, and lots of people going in lots of different directions in that. Exactly, wonder, in the train. I wonder if you, Claire, as a Christian, feel, we'll, we'll take the, the take the religion out of this essentially for this question, but uh, yeah. the, the Islam or Christianity or Hinduism or whatever, do you feel mm -hmm. in public life that actually Christianity is under attack? I think Christian life is being, and Christians have been um, diminished, diminished in stature, diminished in numbers, diminished in their faith. I don't think there's enough support. Um, local churches are feeling the, the brunt of the effects of the lockdown, where people couldn't go to the places of worship to worship. Um, do I feel they're under attack? Yes, I do, because we are a very secular society. And this is, comes from a very left-leaning left position because it's all, you're all things to all people and things should be watered down. And if you, if you practice your faith, then there's something sometimes wrong with you. And that's the way the media and that's the way society is sometimes making people who have faith feel because it's the wrong type of faith. We found that with um, transgender issues, with gay and homosexual issues, with LGBTQ+, um, the, the flags and, and everything. It, it's virtue signaling to a certain extent at the cost of and at the expense of people who have faith and people who feel they have a moral compass and also, Peter, people who feel and do have a voice. They feel a lot of the time that their voice is not being heard. Well, Network this Real might say maybe we're, just... we're giving these people a voice by putting tracts of text and, and they're putting religious messages out there. Would, what, what do you think of that argument? But this is, no, I don't, I, I don't think much of that argument at all because it is, it is a public place. And I think it is divisive to put any religious notes, as I said at the beginning of my piece, religious notes, religious tropes, anything at all about that. I mean, even now, um, a network really have got the cheek to say they admit and they acknowledge Christmas. Well, I'm sorry they don't. It might be a happy Christmas, but it's bordering on now. Happy holiday. Yeah. Yeah. That's so American. That's nothing about Christmas. That's totally, nothing totally agree, Claire. We've got to, Christ. we've got to, got to Christ. remember Christ. the name of the, the name of these festivals and keep Christ and Christmas. Because thank in you. the name, Peter. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Claire Muldoon, broadcaster. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thanks to everybody who's been in touch as well. Uh, because we asked you if Rishi Sunak should call the general election. You've been texting and tweeting us this afternoon. Uh, Jamie Brown has been in touch. He says, yes, the country can't go on any longer with this weak, pathetic clueless government, uh, says Jamie. Uh, Ray has been in touch on Twitter to say, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. We are launching from one inept government to another in the Labour Party. But to be honest, what's the point in Sunak hanging on at this point? He and his party are contributing nothing positive and the Tories are just postponing a wipeout. Uh, Jackie Scott says he should resign and let a Conservative uh, take charge. Um, little Madam has been in touch and says, get this unelected idiot out. Not clear if she's referring to Rishi Sunak or indeed me. Uh, on text, Ron says it makes no difference. They're all as bad as each other. Whoever wins, the British people lose. Becky says yes, but he won't because he knows he will lose. And Janet says, why can't we call an election? He's failed and wasn't even elected. Well, on the phone now, 0344 499 1000, is Matt calling from Cheshire. Hello, Matt. Hi, good afternoon, Peter. What do you make of this election now? Uh, can I just firstly say, raise a glass to the uh, Irish people for the back of Leo Varadkar and hope they celebrate today. Right. Um, why, are you, why, why would you be raising a glass on that one? Because he, I think, well, I hope, hopefully Simon Coveney won't replace him, but I think a lot of people in Ireland will be genuinely happy today and... Um, Hopefully they won't make the same mistake next time. Yeah, it's an interesting um, one, isn't it? Because um, 
well, the, the look as if there'll probably be two general elections, one in the UK, one in Ireland. And, of course, the fact that uh, three, was it three quarters of the democratic world is going to the polls, America as well, uh, India, many other places, European elections and so on. Here in the UK, Matt, uh, when do you think we should have an election? Sunak is stalling because they haven't decided and can't even think of a strategy. All they've said for the last six months is, we have a plan, they don't have a plan. We don't know what his plan is apart from inflation has gone down and a third of illegal immigrants is stopped one third. Mm. 450 came over today, that's one and a half times the amount of people that would go to Rwanda. Yeah, well, that's, that's a really good point, Matt, and I do, I do wonder what the point of that actual uh, policy is. It, it, I mean, it's fewer than 1% of people who have come across. Matt, thank you. That was Matt in Cheshire there. James on, and Aberdeen has given us a call as well, 0344 499 1000. And I think you want to share your experience of prison, James. Have you been in prison yourself? Yes, I have, yes. Uh, many, many years ago, probably about 35 years ago, but it was a short-term prison sentence. And uh, the experience for me was quite acute. Well, it was a short, uh, sharp shock. That's what sometimes people talk about, James. Yeah, I was in... Uh, I did six months, uh, but I did three months of that, and first of all in a, uh, in a, a, a prison and then a semi-open prison. And the experience for me was very clear. I wasn't going back. Yeah. And I just wondered why uh, why nobody's looking at those numbers. How many people don't reoffend, and by taking them out of the system with those short, short kind of prison sentences, they then are, they just remove the burden from the rest of the you know. Like, but but for you, James, who did the trick. It said, "I don't want this as a life. I, I want to reform my ways and go on the straight and narrow." I being in prison was not a nice experience. I mean, I wasn't bullied. I didn't get any harassment. It was just easy time, as you call it, but uh, I just, I'm not coming back here. Yeah, yeah, well, good for, good for you, James, yeah. and good for getting your your life back on track anyway. That was James in Aberdeen telling us just briefly about his experience of, of being in prison. I've actually been behind bars, not as a prisoner, but certainly seen a few of them. I used to work at the Ministry of Justice as an advisor, uh, so it's an issue I know a lot about. Uh, sadly, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please do uh, the same tomorrow. I'm in Free and Collins again. Between three and four up next is Vanessa Feltz. Have a great afternoon. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp, Mr.